We shared on Blessed Are the Poor two weeks ago. Um, and then this week we're going to be sharing on cha chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. Um, we know that last week Josh spoke. Josh is actually in, at the uh, Milford Church today speaking. So that's where he and his family are. So we pray the Lord is, is using them mightily this morning. And um, then next week, uh, <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, Gretchen and I, when it comes to planning vacations, we just don't. We don't do it in advance. Um, we planned a um, spring break vacation a week and a half ago, so therefore we got the you waited so late discount. Uh, no, it's not at all. Even remotely, everything is triple the price when you wait this long. But uh, you know what? One of the things that I was actually going to share on today, which I'll just mention it right now, is the importance of having experiences with your kids uh, as, as opposed to necessarily presents. I guarantee you if I asked Aiden what he got for Christmas three years ago, he has no idea. But they still talk about how we used to go to Outer Banks with this group of families and we would stay at a beach house and we, they would play lacrosse and soccer on the beach and, and how the summer after Stella passed away that we, we went on an um, RV trip and took Denny with us, uh, Gretchen's dad, and we went up into the UP and, and, and all the fun that we had doing that and everything. And so they still talk about those times, the experiences that we enjoyed. But I guarantee he has no idea what I got him for Christmas, maybe even this year. I hope you better. <laughs> but after 12 months go by, they don't remember gifts, but they certainly remember the experiences. And it doesn't mean you have to spend money. Yeah. You could go to whatever, go to a park and, and out in, at... Uh, Kensington and have the birds laying on your hands. Anthony loves that kind of stuff and on your head and, and all those different types of things. Experiences that they had. So I don't remember why I said that right now, but it, it fit later on. So anyways, um, oh, so we, that's why. So we decided to go away. I have one more besides this year. I have one more spring break with Aiden uh, who, who don't know what he's going to be doing. He doesn't even know. Uh, and we just pray the Lord's guidance for him, what he wants to do in the next stage of his life. He's finishing up his junior year, and, and this is a big time of decision and, and so forth. And so we decided, you know what? We only have one more besides this year, spring break with him at home. Uh, potentially, who knows what's going to happen. Either he'll be working or he'll be away at school or whatever he's doing. So for sure, we only have uh, one more, so we're going to do it. So we're headed down to Florida, um, and it actually was... $200 cheaper for me to leave on Sunday. I was trying to schedule everything to be gone Monday, Monday to Saturday. Uh, as my um, Uncle Gene said, I was born on a Sunday. I was a good company man back in the day, so <laughs> the pastor didn't have to lo miss work when I was born. Well, now I'm a good company man because I always try not to miss Sundays. And so I was trying to schedule it Monday to Saturday, go away with my family and still miss no church. And the flight was $250 cheaper to leave on Sunday, which made no sense whatsoever. So I chose that. So we're leaving on Sunday morning, and uh, we'll be back on Saturday. We'll be back for Resurrection Sunday, of course. Um, so that is the reason why Pastor Casey will be with us next week. He was excited to be able to come and share on Palm Sunday. And so I trust that as they come next week, that you will make them feel welcome, greet them, and welcome them in as, as uh, part of the family. They are, over the years, have become so much a part of us. So let's go ahead, and you're already there. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, and read. It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's remind ourselves here, blessed means happy, fortunate, highly favored. The word mourn there means to be sorrowful. We mourn over disappointment. And the Lord sees our, your loss, your disappointment, and says, I'm in this result. Though it may seem devastating now, it is either not my timing or I have something better. So many times when we are faced with something, we want something so badly. You know, there are those recently that maybe they were believing for something and, and they wanted it. This is perfect. And then the answer was no. And I believe that the Lord has three answers and three responses for us. One is yes. One is definitely no. Hard no or hard yes. And the last one is, which I call slow, which means maybe not right now. 
And so many times in our lives where we were wanting something so badly, we wanted it, we had to have it, and looking back now, we're like, that would have been a terrible thing for me to have. That job, that car, that house, that whatever it was, that person in my life, I wanted so badly, I was believing God for it, and I wanted it, but he knew better yeah. than we did. And it isn't always yes or no. It is, sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it's not right now because there is something that is coming down the road that he already knows about that it's not my timing yet. But in my timing, I will walk you through my perfect plan. Yeah. And so we have to trust in the Lord or we don't. Recognize that we're in the hollow of his hand and know that he does all things well. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I'm grateful that we can serve a God that watches over us that protects us, that provides it for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, we don't want to, if it's something that is not His direction, no matter how great we might think it is for us, you don't want it anyway. That thing that you think is going to be such a perfect thing in your life may be destruction. So be careful. Blessed are those who mourn. This word mourn is not casual sadness. It is actually the strongest word used for mourning in the Greek. It is used for when mourning for the dead, mourning over the loss of a loved one. We mourn, I've said on many occasions, we mourn to the level to which we love. This week, Megan lost her grandmother, someone who was a, a pivotal part in her life and her family's life. And so we weep with those that weep as her family mourns the loss of the matriarch of, of the Hamlin family. This is the type of mourning that Jesus refers to here. And I told her this week, I said, listen, I had already planned on talking about blessed are those who mourn before your grandma even passed away, and here we are, the Lord seeing you. Yes, yes. And what you need. She, it's okay if I tell what you said? <clears throat> her grandma had been at 90, 90, 90, 90 years old, right? Look, a strong life, very healthy, and, and recently she had uh, come under some ill health and, and hated it. She was weak and was losing uh, strength in her extremities, and, and, but she was such an independent woman, she wanted to get up and use the bathroom on her own, right? You know, here she is. And as a result of that, had fallen and so forth, and so things were deteriorating. And Megan had said, was that Tuesday, Monday? Yeah, one of the days this week. She said, you know what? Why does the end of life have to be so gross, yucky? I just want her to be able to go home, spend, spend the rest of eternity in, with the Lord who she loves and serves. It doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be so messy. I just want her just to be able to go home. Within hours, she got the call. Grandma's gone home. Lord's faithful. Yes, yes. Lord's faithful. Still doesn't, we on this side of things, she's not mourning, but we on this side of things mourn for the loss. Blessed are those who mourn. Another example of this mourning is true sorrow over the state in which our sinful nature is. It's an example of that. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This nation we live in is corrupt and selfish, acting on its own selfish desires to get whatever they want in any way that they see fit. Check out some of these stats. Last year in the United States, 20,000 murders, 55 a day. 146,000 reported, keyword, rapes in the United States last year. 400 reported a day. We know that there are many that go unreported. Likewise, 11,500 reported cases of human trafficking. That's 31 people per day that disappear that we know of. The number, the actual real number is much higher than that. One million abortions per year. 2,700 
and 40 per day. This is the level of mourning that we are to have when we consider these types of loss. That we are to mourn over the devastation that it's creating in our culture. This is what Jesus is referring to when he says, blessed are those who mourn. It's not a, oh, I'm sorry because I got caught in the middle of something. We know in 2 Corinthians 7.10 it says, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. That's a good thing. But what happens when we mourn? It says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What's that word comforted mean? It means to call to one side. And I love the picture of this. Anthony, come up here for me a second. Here is the picture. Have a seat there of being comforted. It says, I see your pain. I see your struggle. I see your disappointment. And I come alongside. And I bring comfort. This is the word. Many of you have experienced Situations of disappointment, of loss, of true mourning. And the Lord says, I'm going to come alongside you. Thank you, Lord. Give you comfort. Amen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Thank you. Psalm 94, 19 says, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, you comfort, your comfort delights my soul. When I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling unsettled, your comfort delights my soul. I'm going to look at Psalm 23. We discussed this in our last Bible study. And I felt it was fitting to go back to one portion of it. Psalm 23, very familiar. You know it. We're only going to, we're going to pick out two verses here. Verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are what? With, With me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yeah. And I was thinking about that rod and staff. That seems like an interesting phraseology to say that a rod and staff comforts. Well, let's, let's look at the a staff of a shepherd. This is what this is, right? This is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It was talking about the, the genre or the, the, and the voice and the, and the thought of a shepherd. What does a shepherd's staff look like? On one side, it has a hook. One that is used for is to redirect, to, to correct, to bring back. It's also used, you've, you've seen that, that video where the, the guy pulls the, the sheep out of the, that like little crevice in the, in the ground and it gets up and he pulls them out and he's jumping along all of a sudden and he jumps right back in it. How many times is that us? The Lord pulls us out of the mess that we are in and in our idiocy, we're like, doo, 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 we fall right back into it. But that hook was to be able to pull you out of the thicket, pull you out of the, the ditch, pull you out of a hole that you fell into. Aren't you grateful for the hook of the, the Lord's staff? Yes. But on the other side was a club. And that was used as a weapon because the shepherd not only provided for, but he also protected the sheep. And those that tried to come along and, and steal away one from the fold, he would use that club end of that staff to guard and protect, to beat him away. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Yes. Huh. That's an interesting thought. 
your correction, your protection. That's a comfort to me. Interesting. Why is that? Because when we have clear guidelines, when we have clear rules in which to follow, so many times we think of rules as a bad thing. Let me tell you, your kids, if you imagine, if you give them the parameters in which they are allowed to have free expression, there is such freedom in that. But if one day it is this standard and the next day it's way over here, I am the Lord, I change not. The examples that we have, the Lord is so many things that we're to follow. As parents, I understand it's not easy, right? It is something that you do. There's no rule book for it. You just, anybody just can become a parent and well, then here you are. Congratulations. You have this first one and guess what? We've never done this before and so you're learning right along with us. All of our mistakes, we're going to make them with you. Congratulations, firstborn. But I imagine... For those of you that have ever been to a dog park before, you go into the dog park and what is on the outer edge? A fence. And the dogs get in there and they run wild. And you're not worried about it. Why? Because there is a clear perimeter all the way around. If you were to go to some huge open field or some uh, park or whatever where there is no Parameter, perimeter around and you just let them go and they took off, that'd be a little unsettling. Yes. Your rod and your staff comfort me. The Lord has set the boundaries of our lives, not to restrict you, but to give you freedom of expression inside of that. Amen. Amen. To find comfort in that because if you were to, using our dog example, if you were to, if there was an open gate on the other side, some of those dog parks you go up and over and you can't even see them. And all of a sudden, they come running around over here, chasing some other whatever. But if you go up and over and there's an open gate, that's unsettling. Because there's a way for them to escape and get away from what it is that we, the safety of the, that space. I want you to consider something else. You're driving down a road, a two-lane road, going 55, 65, 70 miles an hour in one direction. And so is somebody else. The exact same direction going the other way. And you have no idea who they are. Why do you feel safe? Why do you not just drive off into the ditch thinking that they're going to hit you? Because there's a powerful yellow line right in the middle. <laughs> so strong. What is it? It's a clear distinction. It's a parameter. It's a rule that says you don't cross over it. Yes. We find safety in that. Yes. My last example of this. You drive in a humongous parking lot. Imagine 12 Oaks or whatever. And you're driving and no cars around. But you're driving and there's another car coming and both of you are driving on the proper side and you're driving in a situation, and I understand 12 Oaks is one way, forget it, 12 Oaks. But you drive in in a parking lot and there are one car going this way and one car going this way and you're both in between the lanes. Are you concerned about it? No, because why? They're on their side, I'm on my side. We live in the United States. We drive on the right side of the road. Everybody knows this. I find safety in that. However, out of the corner of your eye, you see this rebel coming and he's driving all willy-nilly and he's driving across the parking lot. He's going across lanes. He's going across the parking spots. And what do you immediately do? You break. Because I have no idea what that sporadic person is doing. They could be 200 yards away, but because of the uncertainty of what they could possibly do, you stop. Why? Because there's safety in that lack of motion. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your children will flourish in a space where they have clear guidelines that they are allowed to freely move within. Likewise can we. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, it's the same way 
with the Lord and that guideline and the parameters. We walk in obedience to His Word and listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil, like it says in verse 4. Then in verse 5, it says, we can sit down at an abundant table in the presence of our enemies. Why? Because we have the protection and the provision of the Lord. Your rod and staff, comfort me. Job is a powerful example in Scripture of someone who experienced significant loss. He experienced profound mourning. If you want to turn to the book of Job in chapter 1, it provides a detailed account of Job's intense suffering, loss, and deep emotional pain that he endured. So let's turn to chapter 1 and verse 1 of Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Wow, what a testament. Let's look at some of these words and what they mean. Blameless means perfect, complete, morally innocent, having integrity. It says Job was blameless. It doesn't mean that he was sinless, but it means that he was blameless. I'm going to show you the difference. Sin is vertical. We sin against God. Blameless is horizontal, meaning that he lived before the watchful eye of his peers and no one could justly charge Job with any moral failure. He had an impeccable reputation. We know that he wasn't sinless because there was only one, Jesus, that was like that. But we do know it says that he was blameless So those around could not bring any charge against him. Additionally, blameless meant complete in his respect, obedience, and devotion to God. Secondly, it says that he was upright, which means righteous. It says one who feared means reverent God and shunned, turned aside, avoided Evil. Now, in raising our boys, we taught them an expression to bounce their eyes. Bounce their eyes, right? Trying to keep their eye gates pure. So when they were younger and, and, and we would be going through a grocery line and maybe there's some kind of whatever uh, publication in the rack or whatever, we'd be like, bounce your eyes, right? Going into the mall, and everybody seen the video where the guy walks past the, the one lady's store and he walks like this, it's behind him, he's doing one of these, right? So he doesn't turn around. But walking through and you see Victoria's Secret through the mall and the boys, bounce your eyes because all the things that are just right there out in the open, thank you very much. That's what this is talking about here, shunning evil, that you avoid it. Bounce your eyes. Keeping your eye gates Pure. But what a testament to his character. This was his reputation. When you read in this chapter, you're going to hear this. We're going to hold off on that, but you're going to hear this reputation on multiple occasions. And I thought about this. What does your reputation say about you? The testament that is being written about today, when they get to your name, what is being said? I don't know about you, but I would love if my testament and story and reputation was similar to Job's. So I wrote one for myself. And I would encourage you to do the same. Clark, son of Charles, was blameless and upright, one who feared God, worshipped in spirit and in truth, upheld the sacred scriptures, shunned evil, cherished his family, loved others, was kind even in the face of frustration, was passionate toward life, was genuinely interested in others, and shepherded the house well. So I took that and I saved it in a note in my phone, and I'm going to refer to it also. My, all, often, I would refer... Back up. I would encourage you to do the same thing. 
How do you want to be known? And then I would encourage you to refer back to it and say, hmm, has it changed? Are there other things that I can add? Am I living up to my own expectation of the testament that I want for myself? Let's continue reading here about Job. He had, verse 2, seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. So we see here, he has a big family. He was blessed intrinsically and materially. It says that he was the greatest of all the people in the east. Now, continue to read here. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, verse 4, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, Job would send and sanctify them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So, let's look at what's happening here. So first of all, we see it says there are some celebrations going on. It doesn't guarantee just because they're celebrating. It could have been a birthday. It could have been some time of other celebration, whatever they were doing. It said just because they were celebrating doesn't mean that they were sinning. However, Job said it may be in the event that it might happen, I am going to go and sacrifice on their behalf. Now notice here it says that their sons would go and feast in whose houses? Their own. So these weren't young boys. They were grown, had their own families. What does that tell us? Parenting doesn't start when your kids leave the house. We are still to pray for them. We're still to cover them. We are still to continue to speak truth into their lives. And this is exactly what he was doing. He was interceding for his children even when they were grown. Verse 6. I initially, there's a point that I want to get to with Job, and I initially thought to myself, I need to mention what's happening here, but I don't want to spend very much time on it, so we're just going to hit it and move. And then as I continue to read, then the Lord just kept on saying things to me, so I'm like, okay, all right, I'm going to, I'll just listen. Got it. Now there was a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, which is Jehovah. Now, I want to point something out here first. And this has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. But there is a movement, there is a, a, some things floating around out there about the fact of who God is and who God's name really is and all these different things. I'll tell you what, I read in a Bible that says Genesis 1.1 that says in the beginning God. That was Elohim. That is the full counsel of God. That is the full Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were there in the beginning when they spoke the world into being. Nothing else had been created yet. Amen. So there wasn't any confusion. There wasn't anything else going on. It says in the beginning God, Elohim, was there and nothing else. Now these sons of God have come to report. So watch what happens here. So we know who we're talking about. They came to stand before Jehovah and Satan also came among them and said, Lord, the Lord, oh, and the Lord said to him, to Satan, from where did you come? Now, so many times, the reason why I mention this Elohim part, so many times we think that Satan is the villain of God. We think that he's his counterpart. No, he's not. He was a created being who is subservient to him. 
who is also, by the way, defeated. Now we are dealing with the temptations and different things that come into our life. He is, we need to remind him that he's defeated, but it, the Lord is not shaken. The Lord is not moved. The Lord is not concerned. The Lord is not worried about the things that Satan is doing in this world. It is the God, little g, of this world. But he's not concerned about it. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes. Who also, by the way, is seated. <laughs> So the point is, is that so many times we raise the enemy to a level that he does not deserve. Yeah, yeah. It is not God's foe. So let's make that very clear. Now the sons of God came to report, and by the way, the enemy came at the same time. I can just imagine him coming in. So where have you come? Where have you been? Well, I was going to and fro on the earth, and... Uh, we know that, doesn't say it in this portion, but we know that he goes around seeking whom he may devour. That's what's implied. Yes. And I love the idea of him coming in with his head bowed in surrender as a defeated foe. Yes. From where did you come? He answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. In verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job. Now, before this, I wanted to make a point and remind us who the enemy is and who he's not. The Lord operates with the assurance that Satan is defeated. We are the ones that need to be convinced of that and to walk in that assurance. You know who he is? Satan is that teenage boy who thinks that he is equal to his parents. What do you mean? You can't tell me to do that. I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> now, my sons would never do that. But here's the thing. If there is ever a time that either of my boys were to speak in that tone and have that attitude. Do you think at any point in time I would be like, oh man, Gretchen, he figured it out. <laughs> what do we do now? He figured it out. He's right. He does know better than us. He is smarter than us. Nope. I stand there with the insurance that look how ignorant you sound by saying these things. Just like the Lord does, the victorious warrior does yes. when Satan tries to make some declaration. You're an idiot. You're defeated. Read the end of the book again. Yeah. Now, have you considered my servant? Ever feel like when you're going through something that the Lord has said, have you considered my servant, Doug? Have you considered my servant, Jim? Have you felt like that before? Say, thanks, thanks a lot, God. Appreciate you having that confidence in me. But watch this. Watch this. Have you considered Job? And watch what he says. There is none like him on earth. He's a blameless and upright man. One who fears God and shuns evil. Now what did that, what leapt out to me is this. People can have, you can have a reputation with people. They can say something about you. They can say, here's your character, here's your this, and they can have a story about you. But when that lines up with what God says, yes. then it's real. Yes. You can fool us. But we can't fool God. But his reputation with others was identical to what God said. And I love that. Thank you, Lord. That would be our testament, oh God. Yes. That our reputation with you would be the same as it is with others. Hmm. Not verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? Watch this. 
Have you not made a hedge around him and his household? <laughs> he already he declared it. He said, Job honors you because you have never, he has everything. You have made a clear hedge. He uses the word hedge around him that I cannot pass. He doesn't say that, but that's what that means. I can't get over that. I can't go through it. You know what we do right now in today's day and age? We apply the blood of Jesus over the doorpost of our homes and over our families. And when the enemy comes, he sees that blood and has to pass over it. He has to go past it because he has no authority to go through that hedge, just like it happened here. He had no authority to go past that hedge that the Lord had drawn in Job's life, and he continues to do so. Have you not had a hedge around him and his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. He was so confident in what Job would do. Remove that hedge. Remove that hedge and he will surely curse you. Watch what happens again. Verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, behold, that he has, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Line drawn. Take away his stuff. But you can't touch him. Clear hedge once again. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Let's read here, verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they killed all the servants with the edge of a sword and I alone escaped have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came. The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, 17, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and raided the camels and took them away. And yes, killed the servants in the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they're all dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. And watch what happens here. Four different messengers come and deliver devastating news. And until he finds out about his family, yes, he lost sheep, he lost his camels, he lost all these other things, but until he hears about his family, possessions can be replaced. But family matters more than anything. And when that happens, how does he respond? He arose, tore his robe, which was a symbol of mourning and devastation, shaved his head, same thing, thought for five seconds to shave my head this morning and I did not do it. (laughs) That would be, that's full Camille right there. That is commitment. Didn't have that. I also did not tear my shirt off. That would have been commitment and embarrassment at the same time. (laughs) Tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground. I can do that one worshipped loses everything everything that he had including all of his kids and the first thing he does is worship doesn't get bitter doesn't blame God doesn't question why I deserve I thought you were good He says, naked I came into this earth and naked I shall return. The Lord gives. I recognize where my everything comes from, my provision. And the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he worships. 
do we have that same response when we experience mourning? When we experience loss? Lord, forgive us when we haven't. Cause us to be able to walk in that type of response. You know, we aren't entitled to anything. What makes us think that we are entitled to His goodness? We're a wicked, fallen people in need of a Savior, and we're deserving of His wrath. However, Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God, and I'm going to insert right here in Ephesians 2, it says, who is rich in mercy, yeah. but God, who is rich in mercy, demonstrates His love for us in this, what? While we were yet sinners. Yes. Even before we were born, knowing what we would do, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say that when we were good enough. It doesn't say when we prayed enough, when we sang enough songs, when we read our Bible enough times, when we did all the good deeds, when we crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. It says while we were yet sinners, that's when he died for us. We weren't deserving of any of it. But he exchanged his righteousness for our sin. He became it. Verse 22 says, In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Wow. Again, there was a day, chapter 2, verse 1, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where did you come? And the enemy answers the Lord and says, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him, watch this, on the earth, a blameless man and upright who fears God and shuns evil. And he continues and still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. You said that he would curse me. And he still has the same reputation, even after all the things that you did to him. He maintained his integrity. Verse 4, so Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that the man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to, his fa to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, here is your hand, but spare, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Line drawn. I set the hedge. I make the rules that you have to play by. Let's be very clear about that. So Satan went out of the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot's herd, which is broken pottery, because it was sharp. And with it, he scraped himself when he sat in the midst of ashes. He was sitting there mourning. He had already torn his clothes. He had already shaved his head. Now he's sitting in ashes and he's scraping his skin because it's itching so badly because of the boils on it. Verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And you know what? All that Job had, everything good that he had was taken. And his wife wasn't touched. <laughs> what does that say about this nagging <laughs> wife? Now, I don't need to be careful because I'm not implying that all are, but this specific one was, and her character is demonstrated because why do you still hold your integrity? Curse God and die. Yeah. Everything that was good is gone, yet she's still there. <laughs> But he says here, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. As one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? Watch this. And shall not we accept adversity? 
In all this, once again, Job did not sin with his lips. No words came out cursing God. Now, we set the stage for all of this to get to this point right here. Now, when Job's three friends heard all this adversity had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. And they had an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to what? Comfort him. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. If anybody was ever mourning, Job had the right to. Remember, the Greek word for mourning is mourning the loss of death of a loved one. Verse 12, And they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept. Each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. They felt the same anguish that he did. They felt the same, experienced the same level of grief that he did. These were his true friends that were mourning right alongside. So they sat down with him on the ground. Seven days and seven nights was the length of time that you mourn the loss of a loved one. And watch this. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw his grief was great. Hey, didn't you get your mirror, please? We won't shave your head, but you can sit down at Job. In the middle. Good, thanks. And they saw him from afar. And they didn't even, Jim, recognize him as they approached. And they themselves weeped right alongside him. They didn't try to fix it. They didn't say, here's what you should have done. Here's what we should do next. But they came and remember the word comfort means to come Alongside. And the level of grief that he was experiencing was so great that they didn't sit there for five minutes and then decide to fix things. Because, guys, guys, what do we want to do? You propose me a problem, I'll fix it for you. That's how we're built. That the Lord wired us to do that. That isn't a weakness. So, this is completely against our character and how we're wired to do this. And they came alongside him, didn't speak a word for a week, and said, we got you. We're right here. We're right here with you. We're here to go through it with you. Now, the next 35 chapters are a recording of some things that they said. They changed their mind later on and they had some bad advice. But we're going to talk about that today. It's not, not, sometimes we say it's not how you, you start, it's how you finish. For these guys, it was how they started. For seven days, they got it right. Yeah. Blessed are those who mourn, for you'll be comforted. Some of you have experienced loss or disappointment or 
your mourning, whatever it may be, something recent, something from the past. And I want to let you know that there are lows that will come alongside because that's what the word remember comfort means, to come alongside and have nothing else. Say, Lord, will you come? Holy Spirit, come and walk with me through this. So that I can say, it is well with me. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's stand. Thank you, guys. Lord, we're so grateful that you haven't left us alone in our experience and our loss. The Lord help us also be careful to respond like Job and say, can we experience the good and not expect, accept and live through and walk through the adversity we experience as well? Lord, cause us not to question your goodness in the face of challenge and, and loss and mourning. Lord, we thank you that you sent another comforter while you were on this earth, Lord Jesus, you were the comforter. Lord, you brought comfort. You, you, you moved with compassion and you touched the lives of those that were needing. And Lord, you haven't changed one bit. You have not changed one bit. There are lives here today Lord, that you see and you are moved with compassion. You see the situations in their lives. You see the hurt. You see the loss. Maybe at times even in secret. But Lord, you know all things and you're omniscient. And we thank you, Lord, that when you ascended, after you rose, that you didn't leave us comfortless, but you sent your spirit. So Lord, we ask even right now by your Holy Spirit that you bring comfort to those that, that are mourning today. Come alongside, O oh God. Bring comfort. We thank you, Lord that you see right into the heart of the situation, Lord, and that your healing power would pour over that, even right now in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you. We bless your name today, O oh God. You promise never to leave us or forsake us. We love you today. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Can you say amen? amen? Have a fantastic week. And always remember, you are loved. You are loved.